us here today. Uh, for those of you that don't know Lynn, Lynn is um, the guru and my hero in terms of special education. I first heard Lynn at my very first parent conference in 1991 when she was a speaker there on special education. So I have known Lynn a long time. Uh, <laughs> That was one of the conferences we held out at Wood Eden. At Wood Eden. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. So a really long time ago. Um, and Lynn um, has um, been an outstanding advocate for students with special needs. In her um, day job, she works with the Learning Disabilities Association of York Region. But in the, her capacity as an advocate, she has done outstanding work for parents at the Ministry of Education. She is the past chair of the Minister's Advisory Council on Special Education, and that's a committee that meets uh, three times a year and actually meets with the minister and senior staff to provide advice about special education. Uh, she's no longer the chair. Um, Joe Travato, who is the speaker here this afternoon, is the current chair, and so Lynn is the past chair of that group and their advisor. Um, but in addition, Lynn has sat on many of the transformative processes in special education by sitting on different subcommittees, providing advice, and always being there as the voice for kids with special needs. So we're very, very lucky to have Lynn here today. Um, and so without any further ado, I'd sort of like um, to welcome her. And I think she has lots of information to share with us that's going to be relevant to you as individual parents. And um, a hello to the people on live stream as well. I think some of you are from Ottawa and Windsor and North Bay, et cetera, so welcome. Um, so I'm glad Allison didn't say I was old, so this is a good thing. <laughs> you know, but then you have to live up to all of that. Um, and um, I am a mom as well. My son is in his, uh, just turned 40, and so you can sort of figure out how long I've been in this journey. Um, he has a variety of different needs, uh, medically fragile, CP, speech and language, LD, um, and um, it's always a journey. So I, I got involved because of my son. I am who I am because of my son, <laughs> um, and then continue working through. So we were supposed to be a little bit of a bigger group, but we are a smaller group. So, you know, I'm going to give as much content as I can. You also have a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, and then there's an evaluation that I'd like you to fill out, and then you get another surprised handout. <laughs> so if I don't get everything, you're going to get, but the incentive is you've got to give the evaluation back, because it's really important for us to have it at a variety of levels. Um, so feel free to ask questions. If I find that the, you know, we're getting past and we're not getting through some of the content, because of the, especially because of the people who are on live stream, I'm really going to make sure that we try to manage both, and I will be here at lunch hour as well, so I will be here and I have to leave about quarter to one. It's our anniversary today, so it was just like, okay, I'll be back. <laughs> Celebrate well and we'll go from there. So, you know, working together, um, effective advocacy and collaboration, that has been what I believe strongly. And I believe that we as parents are part of that team. Um, and we are a partner. And when I started my journey 40 years ago, they didn't want me as a partner. <laughs> You know, I was a mom, like what? You know, and so as you gradually work it through, I learned that you had, you know, if I really was going to work with this, the professionals, I had to learn a lot, educate myself, and in the end, get them to see that I can be their partner, but I'm not gonna tell them how to do their job, but I am gonna tell them about my son. So, there doesn't matter what you pick up today, there's all kinds of evidence that we know the importance of parental involvement. It is key, and, and at this time, in 2016, it's even more. Parent engagement is everywhere. And that will vary for individuals what that means. For some of them, it may mean just going to one meeting, signing off, feeling happy, they're engaged. For others, they might want to come to sessions like this, etc. It will vary from parent to parent. But the evidence is very clear that successful parent and professional partnerships makes a difference for outcomes. And the outcomes is for our students. We may feel good too, but really what we want to do is make sure our child or the learner is learning. When parents are involved, children do better. We know that. I hear it all the time from educators. You know, I have some parents that are not engaged. 
They don't come to curriculum meetings. They don't do this. They don't do that. And I'll say, okay, well, there's a reason. <laughs> you know, so we need to find out why they're not coming. Have we asked them? Have we asked them, why aren't you coming? <laughs> you know, we have to make sure. Maybe they have, they're a single parent and they don't have a babysitter. You know, like there's all kinds of reasons and we need to make sure. So the communication to me, you can listen to all the legislation and I've worked on every piece of legislation since 1980. You know, I believe the legislation is intact. It's there for a reason, and it's how we implement it. And the other piece is how we communicate. <laughs> you know, and it's about relationships. You never know that the person you're communicating with in your community, or in your schools, or in your synagogue, or your temple, could be the next, next minister of education you know, or the next premier or whatever. I've dealt with 10 different ministers, you know, in my capacity as the advisor. You never know, you know, and they listen and they hear. So providing positive school climate, communication, and we've already talked a little bit, you know, it's just really important to do that. So I talk fast for a reason, because I want to get to some of the key points. I think you would all agree you want to be treated with respect. The school is caring. Educators encouraged, there's a school culture, parents are involved, everyone feels safe and secure. No one's going to argue with that. That's what we all want. And then you want to make sure your kid is feeling happy. Every time people would ask me what was my number one goal for my son, any idea what that answer would have been? Say, say it again. Be happy. And they were shocked. That is your goal? I said, that is my number one goal. If his well-being is intact, his self-esteem is intact, then he will want to learn and he will be a sponge and we'll all be happy. <laughs> you know, that's the ideal for me, right? And you'll get to know that I'm an optimist. Um, positive relationships equal creative solutions. If I have a relationship with the people who are working with my son, I will have creative solutions. And if there isn't a solution, we gotta figure out why there isn't a solution. And if it's not in legislation, then why can't we try it? <laughs> if it's not life-threatening, you know, and it's not going to cost mega money, then why can't we try it? Um, willingness to consider solutions other than the way things have been done before. I'm a trailblazer, so things would happen. And they'll say, oh, we can't do that. I said, why? There's nothing written in the law. So they knew right away I knew the law. <laughs> That's your first thing. Educate yourself. You've got to know, you know, know the legislation. Um, or go to someone that understands it. Students get, and students and your kids, they get a sense of your relationship. I never, ever bad mouth any professional that was working with my son for a reason. He is going to pick up on that, no matter who they are. They pick up. Even when he's nonverbal until he was five, six years old, he picked up if I was upset. So I had to have my own little dartboard and do all the things that I needed to do. <laughs> You know, to feel happy <laughs> around him, you know, whatever that is, you know, meeting with the other women, you know, other fathers, whatever. But I never let them know that I was upset. You know, that started from the day he was, you know, born and we had to deal with the medical. You know, they'll pick up how you feel. So really remember that. We're role models. Do we get upset as parents? Absolutely. Do we get upset as educators? Absolutely. But it's how we deal with that. It's not what you say, it's how we, how we say it. So over the years, I've heard a variety of things about effective communication. You know, a positive school climate, parents and, and educators share a common goal. But of course, we don't always come with the same goal. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> we don't always come with the same goal. You know, parents have one goal, the child has another goal, the educator may have another one, the medical profession has another goal. So we come from different perspectives. So we need to understand that. We need to understand. So they need to understand your perspective, and we need to understand their perspective. You know, so a parent perspective may be acknowledgement and recognition of your child's special needs. A teacher's perspective may be, I've got a variety of needs in my classroom and resources and technologies, how am I going to manage this? Because they can do it. They can manage it. You know, there's lots of support for him to do that. It may be, parents' perspective may take time to adapt to feelings such as denial, feel, fear, and anxiety. And I talk a lot about this when I do teacher training, is that we as parents, we as educators, we as professionals go through the grieving process. 
when we are dealing with a child with special needs, whether it's in the classroom, in the playground, or whether it's at home. Some days we're in denial, some days we have fear, some days we have hope, some days we're depressed, some days we're in mourning, you know, we have envy, all of that, and we need to talk about it. You know, and I always have this vision that people are going to go into the classroom and say, you're in denial, you're not, you know, you're in envy. But we need to acknowledge those feelings, you know, because it's okay to have those feelings. It's how long we're in those feelings that we need to address. Difficult matching their desires for the future of their child with that of the child's with the special needs. So again, always try to remember the perspective from everyone's lens. I've been saying this as long as I've been doing workshops since the 80s. This slide I've used a lot. These, if we do this, I truly think that we're there for the right reasons. Parents and professionals, take time to be with each other to listen carefully. We were given two ears and one tongue for a reason. Do we do a good job with our ears? Yes? No? Not sure? You know, we were given two ears for a reason. We really, truly have to listen. We have to take the time to listen. I would say to educators, if you take the time to listen to a parent with a child with special needs up front, listen to what they have to say. They probably very rarely will be in your face the rest of the time other than when they need to at report cards, et cetera. Listen to their stories. Give, take the time up front. Treat each other as an integral part of the planning and decision-making team. You want to be part of the decision-making team, the planning. You know, um, Louise talked about you know, the IEP and how important it is to be involved in the IPRC. You want to be part. We're not there to tell people how to do their jobs, but we are there to say, my child is this kind of learner, you know, and that, you know, he's passive or aggressive or he's, you know, this is the way he does things. If you do too many instructions at once, he's not going to get it. He's not going to give you eye contact, not because he's being rude. He's just not going to do it. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. Um, so we really want to be part of that process. I didn't go to teacher's college. I don't know the curriculum in and out, but I do know how my son learns. You know, so I need to explain, and I know his social needs, and I know his emotional needs, and I understand his physical needs, so I need to make sure we're, we're sharing that. Trust each other's judgment by allowing each person to express opinions and give suggestions. This is not a one-way street. When we're educating and working together with professionals and families, this is not a one-way street. I have people who leave a meeting with their professionals, whoever they may be, <laughs> and then pick up the phone and call. I didn't understand this, this, and this, and this. And I go, oh no, why did you not stop them and say, you know what, I don't understand. Can you clarify that for me? You know, I dealt with a lot of doctors at uh, Sick Children's Hospital and back then Ontario Crippled Children's Center. It's now HUMAC, Blueview, or whatever it's called now. <laughs> you know, there you go, thank you. You know, so that's the new name. You keep changing it on me. And, you know, they will say, I would go in, this will really age me, with a steno pad. And I would have a list of questions, you know, and as they answered the question, I would check it off or highlight it. If they didn't answer the question, they knew I'd be back. I might only have my 20 minute slot or my half an hour slot, but I still had more questions. But I'm respectful that they have another whole 10 other interviews that they have to do with other families, et cetera. So again, it's really, giving suggestions, giving opinions, but respecting the boundaries we were there. And still get your questions answered, and sometimes not right away, but eventually I'll be back, I'm not going away. Um, approach disagreements in a manner of problem solving. In this handout, I've got three or four different examples of problem solving. I believe that every fridge, every garage, wherever you all hang out, there should be a problem solving model on there. If you got it on a phone, put it on your phone. You got an iPad, put it on your iPad. Because we, what we don't know is how to start the question, how to start negotiating, how to start asking these questions. Look at the problem solving. So often we are talking about 10 issues at one time. <laughs> one issue at a time. What is the most priority of that issue? You know, we can't do it all. What is the first? And then we go back from there. Uh, the other one is encourage a second opinion. It's okay to encourage a second opinion if you're doing it for the right reasons. I've done it twice. 
you know, in his 40 years year. They were for the right reasons. <laughs> Some people might not agree, but they were for the right reasons. Um, you, you go for a second opinion when you really, if your gut says to you, there's something missing here, that they, they've, we don't have it. You know, and they, I've had to do it for my own self personally. You know, I said, nope, that's right, I don't care, go run the blood test again. <laughs> You know, I don't care, that's not what, and I'm not in denial. You know, I'm not in denial, I'm not angry. It's just that I know my son, I know myself, and there's something missing. That's when you go for a second opinion. Yeah, don't go for a second opinion because you want to hear something different. Different in that, because you want, don't want that diagnosis. You know, if the child is learning and the child is gaining, then let's keep moving forward. And there are some times that kids will plateau. The best story I can tell you is when my son, speech and language pathologist says, you know what, Lynn, I think maybe you better get another speech and language pathologist. You know, things aren't, you know, Wade is not moving forward. I said, am I complaining? I said, maybe Wade is just saying to you, stop. I really can't take anything more into my little brain right now. And that I really need to make sure I can maintain everything I've learned to date, not lose it, and then I'll be ready. Just give me a little break. She says, you're okay? I said, I'm fine. <laughs> I said, but if he loses <laughs> that language that he has gained and those skills, then we're going to say, okay, what is different? Is it the school environment? Is something changed at home? Did his medication change? You know, what else do we need to do? That's the difference. Got it? All right, any questions yet? So when you look at examples of behaviors that interfere with consultation meetings, here is a few of them. You feel intimidated. What's the solution? Recognize the value of equal partnership. Distrust, recognition, recognition of family and systemic barriers. I will hear people say, they're still talking about what happened in grade one. And their kid is now in grade eight. Really? I can't change the past. I can only learn from the past and then move forward. And that story may be important, but we really need to look at the why is it important because it's still happening, some of those barriers, and go from there. So you can read this at your own leisure, but it just gives you some examples of behaviors and some possible solutions. So you already know that I believe that every barrier has a solution, <laughs> okay? I, I believe that 100%. Yes. Where the administrator in the school comes across as very angry, domineering, not listening. You know, you, you kind of question how they got to that position. It's uh -huh. certainly not the majority by any no. small minority. But how would you advise parents deal with that situation where they're really not being heard because the administrator is very top down? So when you're dealing with the, with a person like that, that they think authority means that they have all the power, <laughs> you know, your best way to deal with them, keep smiling. Keep smiling because how can you get upset with someone that's smiling, right? And, but still ask those tough questions. And I have done this. I have said, you know, are you having a bad day at your school today? Because you, you're coming across like you're upset. <laughs> Are you upset with me? Have I done something I don't know about? You know, that this is part of why of the meeting. It's okay to say that. It's how you say it. If you say that out of respect, out of knowledge that you're observing this, not putting the person down in front of their peers, that you're really just, it's okay to say, I'm having a bad day. Or I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was coming across like that. <laughs> You know, and then eventually, you know, if you're in some of the positions that Allison and I are in, we'll say, you know, we still have a lot more work to do with educators who think that they're not, the parents are not part of the solution. You know, and a lot of the things I'm talking about is about shared solutions. This document, we did so much of this document in 2000, I don't know, what is it, 2007. It's on the ministry website. It's the best document to this day about how to do shared solutions. And People, to people would say to me, can we mandate attitudes? I said, no, I can't put that in the legislation. Would that be really good to put in the legislation? I don't know, because I don't know how we would be accountable to it. But I can look at growth mindset and how you look at things. You know, but 
That, really? That would be what I would do, and I've done it. And is there any, ever a situation where you go over the administrators? Okay. They're not getting it. Oh, they're, they're not getting the message? I feel very, very strongly follow the process. So everybody, everybody reports to somebody. Believe it or not, even the Pope. Everybody reports to somebody. So the question that has to be asked is, I've gone to the teacher, I've talked to the teacher, you know, still not getting any assistance. The principal, you know, so the teacher reports to the principal. After the principal, who do they report to? Superintendent. And this is what I do, and this is what I've done, and what I recommend and what I've done. I'll say to the teacher and the principal, you know what, it seems like we're at an impasse. You know, we seem to be on different pages, different ways of how we're dealing with it. So I'd like to sit down with you and your superintendent. So I'm being respectful that I'm not going behind her back. I'm telling them right up front. <laughs> you know what, we're at an impasse and for the sake of my child and the learner, I feel we need to go the next step. I can say to you that I very rarely had to go the next step. Because, and when I did, it was for a really good reason. I never went from the teacher, the principal, to the minister. I could have, but that's not my role. My role is to look at things provincially, you know, but it, when dealing with individual cases, follow the process. Every school board lays out, and it should be on their website, the process of who you talk to. But if you're in that situation, just, and normally when you do, an effective administrator who's there for kids will say, really? Maybe we could have one more meeting. <laughs> Maybe we just could have one more discussion. And then think about your own, how your body language reacts. Like if you're pointing all the time, that's aggressive behavior. You may not mean it, but that's aggressive behavior. Yes? I just, I just wanted to ask a question. When you, you commented about, you, know, you firmly believe that every barrier can be broken down. Yeah. I, mean, I understand that. I will say that um, I disagree. And yeah. I've seen specific examples where there just simply are barriers that are not going to be broken down. Um, most of them are attitudinal. Um, but what advice would you have for those for those parents that get into that situation where they're literally landlocked and they are not going to make break that barrier? You're trying to keep your emotions intact. You're yeah. trying to maintain respect. It's just not effective. So I don't know if you were here in a few minutes ago, but I talked about very clearly that if someone's behavior is interfering with how you're communicating or interfering with the learning and the barriers, you need to address it. So if you can't address it individually and it's not working and you can't go the next level or you've gone the next level and it's still not working, then part of it is then to come back to an organization such as myself or Easter Seals and say systemically, this is a concern and we need to break down this barrier. And yes, there is still stigma attached to people with disabilities. Yes, there's still stigma attached and then there's still barriers. But the bottom line is, when I really dug deeper in every one of the situations that's been brought through me in my last 40 years, it's the relationship and the communication. It's not the implementation. Sometimes it's the implementation of the legislation. Sometimes it's people who feel they need more, you know, and they want more resources, and there's never enough resources, so we have to work with what we have. But I believe we can, and we can agree to disagree, and that's okay. And there's times where the odd time I said, you know, I'm, I'm here, I agree to disagree. <laughs> you know, but maybe we can't resolve that. But I can't go to sleep at night knowing that learners are not getting their needs met and I haven't done everything I can. And if I know I've done everything I can, then that's all I can ask for. And that's all you can ask for as individual parents, and that's all educators can ask for as well. You've done everything you can. You, you, we don't have a magic wand. Wish we did. It would make life so much easier. I have three grandsons, 12, seven, and five. So far, they all seem to be fine, I'm not sure. Whatever that is, I don't know what normal is anymore. But they've gone through very traumatic accidents and been hospitalized and we nearly lost them and everything else. But we figured it out, we worked it through. So the point today is to understand conflict 
and then looking at a way to resolve that conflict. You know, and a lot of these slides are in the shared solutions. So they really talk about, you know, differing values, identifying and respecting others, concerns about resource allocation, brainstorming ways of doing it existing. I remember one school said, you know, we don't have enough computers, you know, and these kids need it. And I said, what do you need? They said, well, we need blah, blah. I said, fine. Do you know how many computers are sitting in people's basements? Do you need the most iPod 6 or iPhone 6? Well, you might like iPhone 6, but really? That desktop will probably do the same thing. <laughs> you know, so we ended up and we brought, you know, six or seven different computers and the principal in school said, oh my God, you did that? I said, well, you said you needed it. You know, so if there's something I can do, you know, beyond having to try to pay, you know, thousands of dollars, you know, um, then let's figure it out. Um, there could be historical factors. You know, there may be a whole history of disagreements. And I don't know about you, but parents talk to parents, educators talk to educators, and, it, and professionals talk to professionals. You know, and sometimes we're, ethically, we're not doing what we should be doing out of respect. But there's historical things. Well, don't, you don't want that teacher, because that teacher, you know, really didn't do a really good job with your kid. You don't want that principal. They might have done a great job with 55 others, but perhaps not that child. I get calls with people say, I'm moving into your area, what school should I go to? I'm not telling you what school you should go to because your needs should be met in every school. The amount of money that's being spent should be met in every school. So you got the point. <laughs> Understand the conflict, figure, figure out what the possible solution is, and if, there, if you can't find it, then that's where you call upon organizations that can look at it systemically and figure out. Let me tell you, Allison and I have said several times, attitude is a huge thing. It is a huge barrier. I was told two weeks ago there was no such thing as a learning disability. With a group of educators, I said, are you really saying that to me? <laughs> like, are you really saying that to me? Do you have research to validate that? Do you have a research paper that says to me that there's no such thing as a learning disability? If you do, I really want to see it. And I moved on. The point was made. Yes? Uh, inviting other advocates to come. Yes, can I do that in about five slides? Got it. Okay, so here's this. If you leave me with nothing else today, leave with this. See that little happy face there? It's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. I have people always on my side and behind me, and I'll say, you know, did I sound like I was being negative? Did I sound, did my body language express negativity or aggressiveness? If so, I need to, you know, I'm married to an Italian, half Danish, I was educated in Europe. Trust me, I use my hands. <laughs> Everyone knows when I'm mad. <laughs> you know, and I had to learn how to control that, right? I really had to learn how to control that. So, shared solutions on the go, which I talked about. These are tips, this is written by the ministry Lots of professional development done in schools, in uh, administrators, in courses. A lot of this stuff is, you know this. Listen actively. Acknowledge the other party's position. Apologize the validity of the other per party's feelings. Apologize if it seems appropriate to do so. Use humor. I don't know about you as parents and educators, but if you have a child with special needs, humor is really the best medicine going. You know, like, you know, he spilled the milk again. Are you kidding me? You know, like, <laughs> how many times am I going to learn not to put the cup there? I got to put the cup over here, and I got to put the cup in the suction thing. And I, you know, those suction cups. Like, you know, you have to use humor, you know, and one of the days that when I was at Sick Kids back in the 80s, I said, you don't even have any humor in this hospital. Like, you think everything is so negative. Really, we're trying to help people. And they started the library, and now, you know, I mean, they even have iPads in the, you know, uh, hospital rooms and everything else. And my little grandson had, he said, well, I could have this in my room. I said, yeah, get a life. No. <laughs> well, you're here and you're having it, but not at home. Um, change the timing of the meeting, take a break. Sometimes, if that principal is really out of line, et cetera, you know, and you just say, you know what, I, I need a two minute break. You walk out, go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do, come back. It really may just give them a message without you having to set anything. Uh, use yes instead of yes but, you know. Just say, you know, I don't really agree, but I'm willing to think about it, consider it, maybe. Ask questions. 
change, langu change language from you to us, we're in this together. Because you know what? As moms and dads, we're there for the, for the journey. Educators, teachers, they move on to the next family, to the next. Some stay with you for life. You know, you always have them, you know, but really it is about all of us. Agreed on a share manually acceptable solution. I think you said it at the back. You know, there are some barriers that we can't, you know. It's little steps. Like for me to still be standing 38 years later as an advocate to say that we still have barriers is kind of sad for me in some ways. But I know how far we have come. If you guys thought back to two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, you probably know how far we've come. But sometimes we can't resolve every, every barrier. But if I can make a little dent for that next family or for that next educator, then we've done our job. Because some, it takes a while. It takes a while for some things, and it shouldn't. We now have it mandated that we have to do transition for all kids. Hallelujah. When I we first worked on the legislation, it was for kids 14 and up. I said, oh, that's great. By then, you know, we figured we've got it, you know, we need it from the time they enter school to the time they in between classes, in between, air, you know, primary, junior, not just at 14. So hallelujah, but it took another, what, 12, 15 years to get it for everybody. You know, you've got a parent, hopefully, you know, they have uh, your spouse or a partner that can go in with them. This is one parent. They walk into a situation where there's 15 school um, administrators or, or people around the table. Yeah. And, you know, what advice, I mean, it, it's, I don't want to say it's easy to say this, but I know that that's, that's belittling this a little bit, but it, it, it's sort of easy to say this. So when you're in there and you're the advocate and it's your child, you're trying to stay emotional, you're trying to smile, yeah. you're trying to say, no, you're trying to do all those things, but it's you against, really, against 15 other people. Yeah. Some have good intentions, some don't. Yeah. What would be your advice for parents like that? Should they bring someone with them? Should they bring in someone that they feel is on their side? Well, the first thing I would react to, um, if there's any meetings today, today, that are got 15 people involved, then they really need to look at their policies and procedures about having all 15 people there. Because really, you know, those people are taking resources from all kinds of things, and we do not need 15 people in a room. Okay, so I want to talk to you afterwards and know what school board that is, because really, <laughs> that, that really is inappropriate. You know, there are times where families will say, I need this person. If you want to bring an advocate or a support person, you need to look at why you're bringing that person. Is that person there to support you so you feel like you're not alone? You shouldn't feel like you're a lot, a lot of, um, alone because these other people are supposed to be helping you. They're not supposed to be making your life more complicated. They're supposed to be helping your child. But I get it. You know, some people can feel alone. So bring in a supporter. The school has every right to ask who that person is, what qualifications they have. If the supporter is coming to give you emotional support, then say that. Person's here to give you emotional support. If the person's there to take notes, say that. Do not take notes without letting them know because that's disrespectful. If the person's coming in to be an advocate because that person's gonna speak on your behalf, then they need to know that up front. So I think every situation, you ask the same question, every situation varies. You know, um, I believe that it's our job as an organization to empower individuals to be able to know the questions they need to ask and, and the skills that they have and go in and be able to advocate on behalf of their child because one day your child may be doing that and you're the role model for that. But there are times where you need that emotional support and that my husband worked, you know, he couldn't be. We made the decision that I wasn't going to be, you know, full time doing what I was doing, that I was there to help Wade. But if I needed him at a meeting, I'll just say, you know what, I think this is one meeting that that male needs to be in the room. <laughs> That dad needs to be in the room, <laughs> you know? And then be another time to say, you know, I don't need that. I'm okay, we're good. So it varies, but it's, it's important. Just looked at my time, oh dear. Okay, shared solutions on the go. All of this we've talked about, you know, what is problem solving, et cetera. There's another model. Um, find, oops, 
Finding, finding common ground. It's really important to find out what you all agree on. <laughs> Do you agree on these strengths? Do you agree on these needs of your child or that student? Finding what is the common ground. And then after that, you start doing your negotiating. And the other thing I would say that compromise does not mean failure. If it's not life-threatening, I'm willing to compromise, but that compromise will have a time frame on it. <laughs> I'll be back in six weeks to see if this is going to work. You know, but really, it's okay. Um, have a clear understanding of what the issue is. And really, so often, whether it's 15 people in the room, which is sad to hear that that's still happening, um, there's so many issues, we can't address all the issues at one time in one meeting. Yes. Oh, please don't make sure we're not scaring you. <laughs> let, me, let me also say that. So I, I um, am approaching this from, from my experience as a teacher prior to being a parent yeah. of a child with multiple exceptionalities. Um, and, and these past two years since she's received a diagnosis, um, like I have invested, I've taken a leave of absence. Like, like I, I consider that I, I know, I, I have read everything, I have. Um, consulted with experts worldwide and, and the whole thing. And my um, concern is how to get those, how to get these strategies that, you know, I, I know to be working at home, mm -hmm. um, how to get those in place um, from the start um, without without intimidating, without saying this is how you do your job. Because I, I understand <coughs> from the other perspective too um, that, that you need to uh, respect the teacher's approach and everything. But when you have a, a child who is um, very complex, and, and you know, in, in my um, years of teaching, uh, I've never encountered anyone like my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, I've since met several children like my daughter. Um, so how do you how do you approach that so that the best um, practices are in place from day one? Because I I, I understand that okay, let's come back and revisit in six weeks. Let's come yeah. back and revisit in a year. But in the meantime, what happens to the education of that student and, and so the best practices for that particular child? So two or three things happen. We talked about transition. So your child, you know, probably is in some type of preschool program, you know, and is going to be going into the kindergarten program. So they should have had a meeting anyways. So that you can verbalize as a mom. You know, not anything else you do professionally means nothing. You're there as mom and that you verbalize what, his, what the physical needs are, what the social needs are, intellectual needs, emo, you know, cultural, etc. I would have it all on one little page, and my kid was very complex. The first thing was all his medical needs. He took nine medications a day, had this machine, like, you know, <laughs> everybody had to figure out, you gotta know all of this first, folks, you know, and then we go with this learning. And I would just break it down, and I'd have one or two things on there that you need to know. This makes a difference. You know, so you're doing your own parent IEP in, a, in parent language, you know, based on what you know. This is what you need to know about Wade. You know, this is what I would feel comfortable knowing that you know this when you walk in. And I'll tell you, most of them respected that. I didn't tell them how to do their job. I said, here is what you need to know about my son. And it could have been, 25 pages, it could have been, you know, a whole binder full. No, 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 broke it down. This is what you need to know. So when he's in the classroom, or when he's in the playground, or when he goes to the washroom, this is what we do. So if we're gonna change that process because we're in a different environment, we need to be working together. So a communication book back and forth is really important. Now we can use emails, now, you know, but figure out what that communication mode is going to be. I would always give the school the first week, ah, you're all off the hook for that first week. I already had my pre-meeting, you're off the hook the first week. That second week, I would pick up the phone and call the teacher and say, you know what, I know you're gonna be starting doing my son's IEP, <laughs> you know, and I know that you, know, you might wanna you know, have some input, so I'm gonna bring you some input about what I think should happen based on my knowledge as a mom. Um, and so they know two things. I know they're doing their IEP, I know that they have to do it within six weeks. I know I have to sign off on it. And I'm sharing what I think some of the areas should be covered. Does that help you? So, uh, this you probably had a chance to look at now. 
Do not look for someone to blame. It's easy to blame someone. That takes up far too much energy. <laughs> you know, it's better to just sort of keep moving. Always focus on the best interest of the student. Uh, commit the time and energy. Determine ways you, we can work together. Uh, what else do I want to say here? Um, monitor the process, progress of the action plan. Uh, use this information as the basis for your next meeting. Um, I always wanted to hear the positives about my son in any meeting that I went into first. And even when it was hard to figure out what that positive was, if they didn't have anything positive to say, I had something positive to say. You know, and my son also attended a lot of the meetings because I feel strongly that they should be in attendance. We're talking about them. If we can't say it in front of them, we shouldn't be saying it at all. You know, I went through all the whole medical system that, you know, we don't hide them. We don't have them, they're there for part of those meetings, so why are we not doing that for a child? Um, sharing details of steps that have been taken related to the issues in the past. Clarifying roles and responsibilities, who's responsible for what. Um, uh, what else? We're getting caught up here. Uh, present a variety of educational suggestions and options could be another one. Uh, making sure that we really understand the child's strengths and needs. You know, and some people will use the word weaknesses, some people will use the word deficits. The bottom line is what is the needs? <laughs> what do they need? You know, what are their strengths, what are their needs? Um, again, listening is really, really crucial. Ask questions which are open, not critical and honest. Share information about the hobbies. Really, my son reading Midsummer Night's Dream was really not something that he needed to read. You know, uh, he has a severe language LD. Shakespeare really might be good for a lot of other things, but really not for him. You know, so I would let them know what some of the other's other interests were <laughs> that might be more appropriate. You know, and now that we're doing differential instruction and universal design and looking at different ways of how we get the same information around and what readings they're doing. You know, if an Aboriginal, I want to make sure it's readings that are appropriate for me, you know, and for my child. So really getting to make sure we share the hobbies and interests. Here are five questions that I believe that everyone, every parent should ask and every educator should be able to answer. Because so often we go in and we ask the wrong questions and we're emotional and we're not really sure, you know, et cetera. But what is my child learning? You know, how will he learn it? How will you, the teacher, know he has learned it? How will the parent know? And how will the child know? These are now questions that are all in learning for all, just worded a different way in the ministry documents. These are questions that I used all the time. If you can't tell me what my child is learning, you know, and then you should be at some point tell me, yeah, he's in grade one, but he is only reading at this level. Is he keeping the skills that he's learned? Yep, okay, then we're good. You know, because he may never catch up, depending on his needs. Focus on the problem, not the people. So often, again, it's about relationships. We focus so much on the people. <laughs> and what they may or may not have done right or correct or whatever. And really, let's focus on what is the issue, what is the problem. Focus on why I want, not what I want. We want a lot of things. But we're not willing to pay for it as taxpayers. We all want one and one with our kids. <laughs> you know, we all want small classrooms. We all want all the support systems going. But we really need to know why I want it. What is missing? Generate a variety of solutions. Seek to understand everybody's viewpoint. Again, listen. Level with the other person. So the person that asked me about um, what happens when someone is using their authority as a barrier in a communication meeting, you know, you got to level with them. So number seven, level with the other person. Oh, I guess I need to push to number seven. Number seven, you know, level. What are you feeling? What would you like to see happen? What are you willing to do? Like, what I'm feeling right now is I feel like you are talking down to me. And I don't like it. As a mom, we're a partner here. We're working together. It's on how you say it. It's on how you say it. My, son, my husband's Italian, and sometimes he thought that people were very condescending to him. You know, as a professional, as a person in the field. You know, he's in there as dad. You know, and he knows. 
And it's not because of dad that he has the disability, because that comes into it too, right? Or mom or whatever. The bottom line is express it. It's how we express it. You know, and there are times where maybe the timing is wrong. If you had a really bad night the night before with your kid, you know, and, or with your student, and then the next morning you have this intensive meeting that's coming up and you've got all these hopes and dreams and everything, and you've had a really, really bad day, you've got two choices. Phone in sick, or call them and say, you know what, go to the meeting and say, you know, it was a really bad night last night, so I'm sleep deprived. I hope that I don't say anything that I wouldn't normally say, <laughs> but can we all work through that? And I say that for all parties involved. Turn intentions into actions. So when we're looking at advocacy, you know, it's understanding the involvement in the life of another. You know, it's there to secure the rights of oneself. Um, we have different types of advocacy, individual self-advocacy, systemic advocacy. I believe today that self-advocacy is where we need to go as, f as long as we can. If that person can advocate on their behalf, let them do it. You know, it's great. Guide them. And I've given you a strategy of how to do that, and we're going to hopefully t have time to talk about it. Um, actually, I want to go back here. and Educate yourself. Knowledge is power. It's what you do with that knowledge. You know, and I would remember people would give me all kinds of things. They would told, to have told me like 400 different ways of how to cure learning disabilities. It had nothing to do with his medical conditions. They were going to cure learning disabilities. Well, as soon as someone told me they were going to cure learning disabilities, I knew I wasn't going to listen to them because you can't cure it. You know, it's lifelong. It's there. We can help. We can give strategies. It's a lifelong learning process, but we can't cure it. So you'll get all kinds of information from other parents, from educators. You know, you take that information, you file it. Okay, I don't, you know, he's in primary. I don't really need to worry about post-secondary right now. Like, really? You know, I don't need to worry about that yet. You know, two or three years ahead of schedule, you need to be sometimes as parents, as advocates. But really, really role model for our kids what we want to make sure we're doing. This is a really good method of advocacy when you're going into meetings. So T. Think, what is the purpose of the meeting? R, review questions you want to answer. A, active, actively participate in the discussion. C, is clarify the terms of procedures. Do you know the outcome of the meeting? Do you know what's going to happen? Because that's your basis of your next meeting. Just put this on you know, the top of your screen if you're using an iPad, on the top of your notepad if you're using a notepad. And what it does is it focuses you. <laughs> it keeps the emotion out. Do the emotion later. <laughs> It keeps it going, and you're focusing on step by step. This is the model that I use a lot for kids, um, but it's great for anybody. So the first thing is stop. What is happening, where am I, and where do I want to be? The next one is think. What can I do? What choices do I have? And what will happen if? So you see there's a pattern here between stop and think. It's like a problem solving model. You know, first, state the problem. Then you think about what are all the issues. The next one is act. What are my choices? What do I need to do? And do it. And to, to do the acting, you have to have the skills, you know, and you have to figure out how to do that. And the check mark is check it out. Did it work? Do things look different? Am I satisfied? You will never, as parents, always be 100% satisfied. As educators, you will never be 100% satisfied that you did everything. But if you can go home at night and know that self-esteem is kept intact and that you've done the best you can today, tomorrow's another day, and we work it through. And the model really helps. Now, remember I think I said there was some humor? I know I'm your little angel mom, but to Mrs. Purdom, I'm this whole other persona. There were days I thought they were talking about a different child. What do you mean? <laughs> my child? No, not my little one. You know, so a humor is really important to you sometimes um, because sometimes you wonder who they're talking about. The greatest problem of communication is the illusion it has been achieved. You can never, in my opinion, over communicate. If you do it respectfully, 
You do it with a smile on your face so you don't have your hands on your hips and your fingers pointing and you're glaring at them, that you're truly working there. Because really in the end, it's all about your child and the people who work with them. My son just turned 40 and I can tell you that his early interventionist, his speech and language pathologist, I can't tell you how many people were part of that celebration. 40 years later, you know, and that was out of respect, out of things that they wanted to do. His first babysitter, who's now a special ed teacher. So I know that what I'm talking about, what we put in this document, does work. But I also know that you will run into barriers. Put it back into the process, the problem, not the people, and work from there. And the odd time, yes, there are people who shouldn't be parents and there are people who shouldn't be teachers or social workers or whatever, but they are and we need to move on. So I know that she hasn't given me the five minute sign, but I know I did it to myself. So I'm pretty close to finishing up here. Um, so building blocks to me are sort of the last pieces of it. Listen, listen, listen. And I even listen to our kids, either through their body language or what they're saying to you, their eye contact, whatever. You, I never asked my kid if he had a good day. I know, he's under a microscope all day long. What do you think? If you had a good day, everybody's watching you, making sure you do this, making sure you do that. You know. But I always knew by his behavior if he was having a good day. I always knew by his, you know, if he wanted to come and show me something exciting. You know. Empathize, we don't want sympathy. We want empathy. You know, if you've never walked in those shoes, you don't know. But someday you could walk in those shoes as individuals. You could get hit by a car. You could, you know, all, anything could happen at any point. So empathy is crucial. Setting up regular communication links, sharing information, avoid jargon. We use so much jargon today, it's unbelievable. And some people use jargon as power. Well, if I don't understand it, I'm going to tell you I don't understand it. But my husband, no way he's going to ask an, another professional what that word meant. Like, are you kidding me? No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, so really we have to try to avoid jargon. I'll get your question in a second. I just want to finish. Ask for suggestions. So often people say, I want you to read 20 minutes a night, every night with your kid. But no one asks. Some people do. But no one asks. Can you? Can you? Some people can. Some people can't read. Some people... They got four other mouths they're going to feed and they're, they're going to another job. Like, we got to make sure that what we're recommending makes sense. You know, respond to suggestions. Time and pace is crucial. Plateau we already talked about. Setting up procedures for follow-up. And it's a two-way street. Keep the focus on the child's best interests. Emphasize what's right rather than who's right. And begin with areas of agreement and work from there. So, one last question. Then I have one last slide, and then I'm still here for another 40 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great presentation, and uh, you know, lots of amazing ideas on how to communicate well with schools. Um, I raised my hand when you said jargon. Yes. I think it speaks to a little bit some of the questions I've heard in the audience, and um, you know, how you are really heard by the teacher, the principal, the school team when you can speak their language and they know that you know uh, what their policies and procedures are. So what would you recommend for parents if they are new to the school special education system? Mm -hmm. How do they get informed about what those special education policies are, what the jargon is, what words they can use? Because mm -hmm. I think words are power. Oh, they are. And, you know, sometimes we're saying, you know, people will talk about inclusion, but we mean different things by it, you know. So the best way for me is that, you know, whatever uh, organization you are involved with, you know, advocacy organization, whether it's Easter Seals, Learning Disabilities, Down Syndrome, all of them have websites pretty well. All of them have things on there to do with education. You know, a one pager of all the different jargon. We can get overwhelmed as parents. I do not want you to go running now and Google the Education Act and know what the legislation says, okay? But I do want you to sort of start looking at websites that are pertinent to you, you know, to learn what some of the language is. You'll get some of it today. 
A lot of school boards, uh, if you're from York Region, uh, if you go on to the York Region Public School Board website under special education, we have a brochure with a lot of the different the words that are used today, you know, through how do you communicate, you know, the IPRC process. Um, even when we go to ministry meetings, they have a glossary of terms. We have glossary of terms of certain words you should use. Um, we, we know that all kids have a right to have an education. It doesn't tell you how the education should be done, but it tells you we all have a right. So it's, it's going through, there are books, you know, there are one or two books. Ken Weber, Weber has a book out about special education and the law. But really going to your associations is really the best route to go. And then we, you know, share different resources. So in closing, um, the power of one. I'm only one, but still I'm one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. So just think about that. One person, you have that power. You add that to the other players, including that, those 15 other people in that room. Can you imagine what would happen if you were all working together for the sake of that learner? Remember that you have the power. Good luck, enjoy your lunch and the rest of your day. I'm gonna go now celebrate with my husband. But I am here to stay until, you know, about quarter to one. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, I wanted to say. One last thing. Sorry, Allison. You have an evaluation. If you fill it out, I have another surprise for you. Okay, and you actually are going to go away with something. Yeah. Okay. And that's pointing out that there are actually two evaluations. There's the one for the whole day, and there's the one for this session that Lynn's put out, and that she wants back over here. So I would like to really thank Lynn for coming. Um, the challenge, as with Louise, is that you have so much information to share, and we limited you to an hour. Because by having this many speakers, we felt four was the most anyone could take in. Well, putting four speakers into a day, that's a lot of information. And any one of you could have you know, done a whole day workshop. So I really want to thank very much uh, Lynn for coming out today. Really appreciated her presentation, especially on her wedding anniversary. So thank you very much, Lynn. I'll thank my husband too. <laughs>